thankful for God's grace. We're thankful for this day of grace. So, looking in Titus chapter 3 today, in verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and, and vain. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sin being condemned of himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity we have together. And we're just thankful that we have the opportunity to be able to read and believe what we read and allow God the Holy Spirit to teach us and to be able to have God edification that we can build up the doctrine in our inner man and we are, we're saved by grace, we live by grace, we show grace, we're gentle and kind and long-suffering with, with people and we're so thankful we have the opportunity to do that. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The message today, the theme is lacking godly edification. That lacking, that's a sad word, but there's a lot of saints out in the world today that are lacking godly education. Why are they doing that? Because it's a choice that people make. Before I had godly education, I made a choice uh, to be where I was at and listen to who I listened to and believe what I believed. So the godly education part you know, we build that up in our inner man. That's why I put that on the board for you. You build up that house of doctrine in you, and it's grace. And you, as you build that up, you show grace in the pastoral epistles. For Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And that's what you show. You apply that doctrine in the details of your life. But I'll tell you what grace does. Grace motivates and produces good works. When you read down through here, in verse 8, for example, uh, Paul said, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Well, to maintain good works, that's grace motivation. That's what grace will do. It will motivate you. And you've got to have the, a house of doctrine built up in your inner man to be motivated to maintain the good works. So, that's what Paul... And, Sometimes we fail to realize Paul was saved by the gospel. He believed the gospel of grace. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and look what Paul said about, said about himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. And you think about the gospel of grace. We believe the gospel. And again, the gospel is Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he was raised again. That's the gospel. When you believe that you're saved. Well, what does Paul say about himself, about the grace of God? Grace saves you. Uh, it's the grace of God. Well, look in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, that, that goes for all of us, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. For the great, by, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul's talking about himself there, but the grace of God which was with me. God's message inside of Paul was doing it. It was inside of him and it came out inside out. And God's grace did that. Only God could do that. Only God's grace could do that. And that's why when you look in Titus, you look in Titus, the pastoral epistle, and you'll see in Titus chapter 3 there, and he says to be careful to maintain good works. Titus 3 8. Well, that's what grace produces, is good works. And it also, grace will help you and motivate us to maintain good works. And you'd say, well, what are some of the good works? And there's many, but go back to Ephesians 5 for, for an example. Ephesians chapter 5. And look, we're talking about what are good works. Well, Ephesians 5.18, and notice it says in Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, how are you filled with the Spirit? You've got to take the Word in. You've got to let the Word of Christ dwell in you. You've got to build up the doctrine in you to be, be filled with the Spirit. 
And study, as you know, y'all know, is work. I mean, I can read if I I can read for an hour or two hours, and, and it, it affects me physically and mentally. I'm worn out some, but it's a good thing. So you have to work and be filled with the Spirit. And when you do it, when you're filled with the Spirit, you've got verse 19, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. When you're filled with the Spirit, there's joy inside of you. you you've got the joy in you. You've got the thank, thankfulness in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God. And you've got the submitting in verse 21. And this is what a lot of people don't see. They always want to talk about why I submit to your husband. Well, look what's first. In verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Everybody, everybody here, we ought to submit one to another. You're, you don't have dominion over me or anybody else here. We submit one to another. And then it says, you're filled with the Spirit. You submit. In verse 22, why submit yourself? Well, they can do that by being filled with the Spirit. You can go on down through the chapter there and you can see the good works. And, you're, and that's what it takes for all of us to have a, a local assembly to do the work of the ministry. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. And you've got to, we, we understand that, but it takes work on our part as individuals it takes reading the Bible, it takes studying the Bible, and it takes uh, applying the doctrine. It takes for me to take this doctrine in me and apply the doctrine of grace and let you see that in me, in my life, in my inner man. So these are just some examples of being uh, good works. So go back to Titus chapter 3. And when you look about good works, Titus 3.8, Paul says in the last part of that verse, these things are good and profitable unto men. I mean, they're good. That grace produces that. Uh, and uh, these things are good and profitable. But notice what he says in verse 9 now. Paul gives something else to Titus, and he says in verse 9, but avoid foolish questions. That's one. And also genealogies. There's another one that you avoid. And contentions. That's another one. And strivings about the law. You avoid that. Why do you do that? For they're unprofitable and they're all vain. And vain. That's why you avoid uh, things like that. When you avoid something, you flee from it. You run the other way. Uh, these are all, and, and when you think about verse 9, these are opposite of what we've read about in Titus 3, 5 through, uh, through 7 there. And we won't go back over that. So, Understand this, when Paul writes this, the body of Christ is in apostasy. And the body of Christ is still in apostasy. And you, you know that. People have fallen back, even people that have the message and they've studied, and they, they quit and give up for whatever reason. But uh, we, we're living in a time of apostasy is what we're living in. And... Uh, the question would be, when he write, Paul writes this letter to Titus, why did he leave Titus at, at Crete? And to answer that, why did he leave him there? Go back to Titus chapter 1 and look at verse 5. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul says in Titus 1 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. See, there's things that are wanting there at Crete with believers and ordained elders in every city. You need to notice that. What do you got over in 1 Timothy? Or you got bishops, elders, and pastors. Ordained elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So that's why he sent him. But he told, he told Titus in verse 9, Titus 3, 9, but avoid foolish questions. And what, what is a foolish person in the Scripture? Uh, there's more than one example, but I'm going to give you the, the Gentiles are in, in Romans chapter 1. They're, they're, they were foolish. Go back to, Gen, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1. Go back there. These Gentiles were foolish back in Genesis is what I was trying to say. But Romans 1.21, you think about a foolish person in the Scripture. Romans 1.21. And notice he says this, Paul does, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, <clears throat> neither were thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now here these, believe, these, these Gentiles, <coughs> not believers, their foolish heart was darkened. They decided to ignore God's word, what they did back then in Genesis. And you can read all, all the way down through Romans chapter 1 there. And the question would be for us, can I have a foolish heart? And yes, I can. And you can too. We all can. We can all have a foolish heart. Now here's, here's the thing. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. We're talking about a foolish heart. First Timothy is a pastoral epistle. First Timothy chapter one and verse three. Paul says, he says, As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Well, what is it when some man or anybody teaches another doctrine? They change the doctrine, is what they do. And Paul tells Timothy, he told him there, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. That was what he's telling him there. Well, in chapter 1 there, 1 Timothy 1, 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister what? Questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. You know, we've got a, we've got a position, we've got an opportunity and we, we, it's our place to edify, to build up people, believers, not tear down. And he said there, give heed to, neither give heed to fables. Notice that there. Well, what's a fable? Well, your faith is based upon experience. That's what it is. And that's what a lot of people do. They base on what, they're, what they believe based on what their experience is. And like I've told you before, I, be, I was saved in a, in a church that didn't believe right division. And it took me a while to grow. And once I learned the truth, then you're making progress. Why am I making progress? Because I've been justified. I've been declared righteous. I understand it's God's righteousness. Now I want to walk after the Spirit, not in the flesh. I don't want to walk after that flesh. And the only way I'm going to do that is to make progress called progressive sanctification. I'm set apart to make that part progress. And fables is based upon experience. And there, you know as well as I do, a lot of people you talk to, they tell you experience instead of what God's Word says. And 1 Timothy 1 4 talks about endless genealogies. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Well, genealogies, that's who's who. You know, that would be a, a thing that Israel would be important to them. The 12 tribes of Israel, for example. Uh, about the genealogies. You know, and the thing is, when, when people uh, teach other doctrine, go contrary to the doctrine, what should we do with people that are contrary to the doctrine? Turn back to Romans 16. Paul tells us what to do. Romans 16, 17. We're to maintain unity in the local assembly, not division. <clears throat> We're all to think the same way, sound doctrine. Not go contrary to the doctrine. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions. What do you do when somebody's contrary? You mark people that cause divisions. And offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. That's what you do. You avoid them. And you mark uh, even at saints. They're not an enemy, but they cause division, contrary, an offensive contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. And when that avoid, that's separation, not unity. You know, a lot of people have got the idea you can just do whatever you want to, say whatever you want to say, but there's got to be unity in the local assembly. That's important. And that's why the endless genealogies, and go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look at this, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and look at verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 7. And Paul was faced with this. I mean, Titus was faced with it. Timothy was faced with it. And you look in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and notice there in verse 7. 1 Timothy 1, 7. 
Talking about the ones what he's already talked about, teach no other doctrine. In verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And that's pretty sad when people, they try to teach something, they don't understand it, nor whereof they affirm. And desiring to be teachers of the law, what, what they were doing, they were stopped teaching grace and wanted to teach, go back on the law. <clears throat> they didn't understand what they were teaching. That's like today, for example. You can go to Malachi in chapter 3. That's on the law, given to Israel. And talking about tithes and the storehouse. And you've got preachers that stand up and teach that about bringing the tithes into the storehouse. Well, what happens when a, when a preacher puts a, a people on the law? If I preach that, what happens when I put, put you on the law? Well, turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And look at verse 10. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And I'm not going to put you on the law. But look at what happens to the preachers that put others, their congregation, under the law. Galatians 3.10. In Galatians 3.10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. That's what they're under. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Notice that for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now that, it's just that simple. And go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 now again. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look in verse 3. Come out the doctrine, the issue to teach no other doctrine. We read that first Timothy 1. Well, look here in, in 1 Timothy 6 3. If any man teach otherwise, come. Now, what if they teach otherwise? Otherwise than what? What Paul teaches. That's why he's writing Timothy this. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Notice what, what about him. Paul says he's proud, knowing nothing. Why does Paul say a person does that and knows nothing? Because they've rejected Paul's doctrine, what, God, what the Holy Lord Jesus Christ gave Paul. So they don't know anything. And you, you think about that, what about Paul? And you understand there, notice in 1 Timothy 6, 3 there, if, they teach, if any man teach otherwise. And then he says, these things teach and exhort in verse 2 there, 1 Timothy 6, 2. So, you know, when they go against Paul and go against the doctrine, uh, the sad part is, uh, they teach otherwise, they don't know anything. And when you read verse five, 4, he's proud, knowing nothing. There's a lot of proud people today that are going contrary to Pauline doctrine. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. And you look, this verse is important to us. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14, 37. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, look what Paul says. If any man think himself to be a prophet, Notice that. Probably somebody speaks for God. Or spiritual. That's somebody that's led by the Spirit of God. Let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now Paul writes that to the Corinthians. And those Corinthians were saved. They'd been justified by the blood of Christ. But they were carnal as they could be. They had divisions and all kinds of problems in their assembly. And like 1 Timothy 6 4 reads, knowing nothing. That's a sad thing. People know nothing. Uh, not dispensational. You know, if you don't know, if you don't have uh, right about the word of truth, and you're not dispensational, what do you know? And you got also going back to Titus chapter 3, you have a lot of this even today in Titus chapter 3 and verse 9. Notice what Paul says in Titus 3 9. Talks about avoid. What what should we avoid? But mm -hmm. avoid foolish questions, come, and genealogies, come, and contentions, 
and strivings about the law. You avoid that, and you don't do it. Now, this is a problem, this dispensation of grace, and we see that when we talk to people. Uh, you know, under the law, you go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you can learn a lot by reading those, those books. And I'll give you an example. Turn to Matthew 23, about the law. Matthew chapter 23. And look at verse 23. This is what the Lord says about the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 23, 23. In Matthew 23, 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's a strong word there. Hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Well, what would be the weightier matters of the law? Judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not to leave the other undone. See, they gave, and they did, but yet they omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. And how do you live by faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. And you can turn over to the Old Testament, and Mike can do about the weightier matters of the law, uh, how they should walk. I mean, they were on the law, but they omitted uh, about the judgment. There, they omitted about mercy. They omitted about faith. They just left it out. You know, and what what did the Lord say about them? Hypocrites. I mean, the scribes and Pharisees are hypocrites. Now, uh, let me say this to you. Go to Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, and look in verse seven. Second Timothy chapter three and verse seven. In 2 Timothy 3, 7. This is what we're, we see today. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And we see that. They're perilous times today. They're difficult times. They're dangerous times. And uh, this is how, as far as living part, you've got in verse 7, ever learning. We've got people who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's, that's something that you see and you talk to people and you can give them the right division and they all want to say that's your opinion. You know, they're ever learning but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the only way you're going to have the truth is to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thy word is truth, John 17, 17. And what do you do with the word of truth? Paul says, 2 Timothy 2, 15, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to do that or you'll never come to the knowledge of the truth. So that, that's very important. You see, ever learning and never ever come to the knowledge of the truth. So what would you say about a person like that? You'd say, well, they're not able to comprehend. Well, is that an excuse for anybody? And the answer is no, it's not. It's not an excuse. You can comprehend. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. There's no excuse not to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth in this dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3.18. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Paul says, maybe in verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice that there. It may be able to comprehend. You read that, does that tell you you can comprehend? And it sure does. It tells you. And the question would be, where do we have the ability to comprehend? How do we do that? Well, we know that here. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. People will say that Hey, I want to be able to comprehend and I want to be able to know. Well, how do I do that? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. 2 Timothy 2, 7. Paul says, Consider what I say. 
Now that's, that phrase right there, consider what I say, that's something that a lot of people are not willing to do. And you know that. You've got to consider what Paul said. And what, what happens when you do that? And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Well, how do you consider what Paul says? Well, you've got to read Romans 2, 5, 8 to do that. You've got to read, and not only that, but you've got to believe what you read. If you don't believe what you read, according to 1 Thessalonians 2, the Word's not going to work in you, effectually. So you've got to believe what you read. You've got to study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed not to divide the Word of truth. So you've got to consider what I say. You consider, you read what Paul says, believe what Paul says, you study it out. You come and, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So the result is the Lord gives the understanding and the Lord give the understanding in all things. And the problem is, we all well, this is not a problem. Man, we've all got a will. We all make choices. Some choices are good, some are bad. But I can tell you this. The best choice I ever made was to believe the Bible is the Word of God and to believe 2 Timothy 2.15 to rightly divide it and to believe that by rightly dividing it that Paul writes Romans through Philemon and I follow Paul and build that doctrine up in me. That's the best thing after salvation that ever happened to me. And being able to apply that doctrine. Now this is another thing. This is a progressive sanctification. You can build doctrine up in your inner man but you've got to apply it in your life every day in the details of your life. You've got to deal with individuals by grace. Not try to put them on the law or not try to have dominion over them, but it's all by grace. You show your, your long suffering, your gentleness, your kind. You're not judging. Paul said, why do you judge? Romans 14. So, going back to Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, <clears throat> Titus 3, 9, but avoid, notice this, a foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. When something's unprofitable, you know what that is, it doesn't give you any profit at all, but also vain. They're worthless and they're, they're, they're empty and vain. So, but look at the next verse now, Titus 3.10. A man, notice this, a man that is a heretic, heretic at the first and second admonition, reject. And it's talking about, a, that's a person doing verse 9. You think about verse 9 there, this person's got foolish questions, genealogies, contention, striving about the law, and all that. What do you do with them? At the first and second admonition, you reject. Teaching, uh, what, what, you know, what they're doing, teaching, pulling you back under Israel's program. A lot of people will try to do that. But notice what Paul says in Titus 3.10. He said, a man is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. So what's an admonition? That's a good question. It's a warning with a view of changing a person's behavior. That's what it is. And not only that, where does admonition come from? It comes from the Word of God. That's where it comes from. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. You know, admonition, you're warning somebody with a view of changing a person's behavior. It could be attitude, it could be actions and all that, doctrine. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine. Well, what's the doctrine? That's the information that we are following. Well, what are we following? We're following Romans through Philemon, that's our doctrine books. We read the whole Bible, but we're following what's to us. It's proper for doctrine. It's proper for root. No set for reproof. Well, what's reproof there? That's somebody misbehaving according to the doctrine. That's what it is. And also for correction. And that's, they have some of the doctrine wrong, and we have to fix that. And that's what you're looking at. In verse 16 there again, for instruction in righteousness. That's where the admonition comes from, the Word of God, instruction in righteousness. You, you want to help people by the Word of God. Not what you think, not your hearsay, what you've heard and said, but the facts in what's God's Word. Now, Paul said in Titus 3.10, 
Very important that you see this. Titus 3.10 People are going to try to use verses on you like this. And they try to do it on that, doing it outside the local assembly. This is for the local assembly, by the way. I mean, people have a right to talk outside of the assembly. It, it, regardless of whether it's on social media or whatever. They're going to talk. You don't have any right to correct them. And this is local assembly. And Paul says in verse 10 there, A man is a heretic after the first and second admonition or reject. And so, what's Paul telling us in Titus 3.10? There's a process to work through a situation. That's what he's telling us. How to do that. A heretic. You might ask, well, what is that? What's a heretic? Well, the Bible says someone is teaching false doctrine. That's what they are. And you know what? Paul was accused of being that. And even though he wasn't. Turn it back to Acts chapter 24. Here's the transition book. And in, in, in the Acts ministry there, and when he goes to Jerusalem, he was, he was accused of wrongdoing. You look in Acts chapter 24, and Acts 24, 14, you read the chapter, but in verse 14, notice what Paul says in Acts 24, 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I mean, they, they claim that Paul is teaching false doctrine. That's what they were claiming. Paul's preaching the truth. And we know that. Well, what's the problem? They didn't like the truth. That was the problem. Acts 24, 5, notice this. Acts 24, 5. For we, are found, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ring leader, leader of the sect of the Nazarene. Well, what are they saying? They're so, Paul's preaching the truth and they don't like it. That's what, that's what it amounts to. They hate it. They hated Paul. Well, look here at this. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's always behind when people accuse you, there's always an intent and purpose. And you, you need to remember that. You know, I've been accused before, uh, with it, even outside of here. There's people are always, there's an intent and there's a purpose when they do it. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19. 11, 19. Paul says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be, be, met, be, may be made manifest among you. Notice there's some bad teaching with the Corinthians. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved. Well, who would be the approved in the Corinthian church? The ones that are mature saints. The ones that know the doctrine. They know what Romans says. They don't have all the books of the Bible at that time of Paul's, but they know what Romans says are approved. So you think about, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So uh, what happens when a heresy comes in the, into the assembly? And it's been here before. It, it, it'll always be there in the assembly. They go and they come. Well, what happens when it comes? Look at Titus chapter 3 again, verse 10. Titus 3, 10. In Titus 3, 10, a man is a heretic after the first and second admonition. Reject. What do you do? You reject. And that's what you do. You know, the thing is, where do you do, what, where do, you do the admonition at? You do it in a local assembly. That's where you do it. And that's why I don't read social media much, very little, because that, that rejecting people and criticizing people and naming people that way as brothers and sisters, that's not edification. And I don't do it. And I'm not going to do it. I, if it's done, if I have to do anything, I'll do it in a local assembly with a first and second admonition. So the doctrine of separation, it's only practice in a local assembly. That's how important it is. 
in my area of responsibility, my responsibility is this local assembly. It's not outside. It's not social media. People, like I said, they have a right to say what they want. This one is done only in, in the local assembly. So what's the issue here? Well, some are teaching false doctrine. And the issue has to be dealt with and brought to a conclusion. And like I said, if you go to somebody and you tell them and, about what's wrong the first time, you go to them the second time and tell them what's wrong again, then what do you do if it's still, they still do it? Verse 10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. That's what you do. You reject it. And the issue you'll find, notice in verse 11, knowing that he, is, he that is such is subverted. Notice that. And sinneth being condemned of himself. Now that's, that's the issue right there. You know, the issue becomes this verse. You give the word rightly divided. That's what you do. Then, they'll, then they will not respond to it. They desire to be under the law. And what do you do? They act, they, 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 they're subverted. Subverted. So what's that mean? They're overturned. What does it amount to? Let me give you an example. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verse 12. I'm thankful for the Word. The Word won't lead you wrong if you're right to divide it and believe what you read. But you notice in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is quick. Notice that. It's quick. It's alive. It's living. The Word of God is. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now you see a lot there in that verse about the Word of God. I'm not speaking, it's God's Word. Verse 12, Hebrews 4, 12, the Word of God's quick, it's living, it's alive, and, it's, and, and powerful, and sharper. Then any, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints of marrow. Notice what else we forget in the last part of that verse. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. A discerner. The Word of God knows what's, what's right and what's wrong in your inner man. And that's what the Word of God does. It's a discerner. It can discern. So you think about the Word of God and why it's important. You know, Psalm 119, I believe it is, and 130. We'll read the verse. Psalm 119, 130, verse 130. This verse means a lot to me because Paul talked about the light shining in our hearts as well. So Psalm 119, 130, Paul tells you, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Whenever I let the word come in me, the entrance of thy word, Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And that, you know, my desire, I want the light in my soul. I lived a long time without the light. Before I was ever saved. 21, that's a long time. But also, I lived longer after they're saved and didn't have the truth. And whenever you put the light in, the entrance of our words give us light. It changes you. It changes your way of thinking. You know, I, this is all of us here. We, we need to make progress in our lives. Progressive sanctification. You're set apart. I'm set apart from the world. And... We, we, we make progress. I don't want to walk in the flesh. I was a sinner and I let the flesh control me for those years. I don't want to walk that way. I want to walk after the Spirit of God. And I want to make progress. I want to build up the doctrine in me. Now go back to Titus 3 and we'll stop. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 11. You think about what's been said about a man that is a heretic in verse 10 
at the first and second, second admonition, reject. Go to the person once, go to the person twice, still the same, reject. That's what the Word says. Uh, verse 11, knowing this, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinners being condemned of himself. You know, the sad part is sinners. And, that's, and uh, it's sin not to preach the Word rightly divided. And you think about the ones that don't. And the Word of God is a discerner in our hearts. So I'll say this to you about God the education. I don't want to be lacking God the education. Because I do know this, at the judgment seat of Christ, I'll be judged right here in the inner man. That house of doctrine is what, that's what you're going to be judged by. It's going to be good, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stuff. So, as believers, we should build up our inner man. And also, as you build this up, not only learn this, but you learn how to use it with people. You learn how to talk to people. You learn how to show kindness and gentleness to people. And you show grace in what you're doing.